Hello. Hello and welcome to everyone joining us for today's discussion on the silencing effects of the digital gender-based violence against women in leadership. My name is uh, Scarlett Varga. I'm head of development at Google, uh, the host of today's event, um, together uh, with our partner in crime, uh, the German Marshall Fund. Um, I must say I'm wearing a double hat today as I'm also representing the Brussels Binder. As many of you know, the Brussels Binder is the organization dedicated to uh, bringing more women's voices in European debates through its free database of women experts. Um, and we have women experts from all different sectors. Uh, before I go ahead and I introduce our great lineup of speakers, um, I wanted just to briefly set the scene and uh, give you a short background on, on our event. Basically, why is it happening and who is behind it? Um, so our conversation today is made possible by the BBB on project, uh, which is a joint initiative by the Brussels Binder, Google and GMF. It is a project uh, financed by uh, DG Justice uh, under the European Union's Rights, Equality and Citizenship Program. And its aim is to take the mission of the Brussels Binder uh, beyond the border of Brussels, um, as the name suggests, creating a pan-European network and a pan-European database. Um, as we all know, 2020 was a very challenging year uh, for all of us. Um, we have, uh, however, had the opportunity to be very productive in this project. We have launched the first European repository of uh, female experts. Uh, this is the database of databases, as we like to call it, um, that to date is hosting actually 57,000 experts among 50 databases. We have launched this database in uh, July uh, with the endorsement of uh, Helena Dai, the European Commissioner for Equality. So this is obviously a great achievement for us. Um, our event today is the closing event of the Brussels Binder uh, Beyond Month. Um, this, is, this was an exciting month dedicated to learning and connecting. So basically this was a month that featured a wide variety of trainings and workshops uh, aimed at bringing together the members of our network um, and discussing how our cause can be um, taken forward and how it can survive the pandemic between others. So um, I will shortly uh, give the word to Laura. Laura Grunendahl is a uh, research and project associate at the German Marshall Fund. She will be our chair uh, today and she will introduce the topic. Um, just a few words about her. She is responsible for coordinating GMF's EU-based cybersecurity work in, co in cooperation with GMF's digital team. So I think you will be in good hands with her. Um, and then our uh, speakers today, uh, Chiara, let me start with you. Uh, Chiara DeSantis is a co-founder and chief policy officer of GenPol. Uh, GenPol is a partner organization of the BB Beyond, and we are organizing this event also in collaboration with them. So thanks for that. Um, Chiara has extensive experience in EU and global policy uh, in the gender and social rights arena. Uh, she also worked previously in the European Commission, European Parliament, and the UN. But more importantly for today's discussion, uh, Chiara is co-author and editor of the When Technology Meets Misogyny report uh, that she will present to us in a minute. Then let me turn to you, Monica. Uh, Monica Ladmanova, uh, she is advisor to Vice President Vera Jourova, EU Commissioner for Justice, Consumers and Gender Equality. Um, she's focusing on issues of gender equal equality, anti-discrimination, minorities and corporate responsibility. She has previously worked with the Shoresh Foundation in Prague and the, in the private sector in IBM. So she brings us a very rich background. And last but not least, Michela. Uh, Michela Paladino, she's public policy manager at Facebook. Uh, before Facebook, uh, Michela worked as director of EU policy for Developers Alliance. For those who don't know, this is a global association um, of software developers. And previous to that, she gained experience in the Italian permanent rep uh, at the EU, of, to the EU and the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Um, so Laura, I will give the word to you, I think. Before I do so, however, I would just like to give a shout out to all our uh, audience members. We have a Q&A session today, as always in our events. Uh, we would love to invite you all out there to get involved in the discussion. Uh, you can do so through Slido, um, simply by typing in hashtag women online, okay? And with that, Laura, over to you. Thank you so much, Scarlett. And also a warm welcome on behalf of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. 
Uh, GMF is a non-partisan policy organization committed to transatlantic relations and works on issues critical to transatlantic interests in the 21st century, including the future of democracy, security and defense, technology and innovation, and diversity and inclusion. And GMF is also partner of the Brussels Finder Beyond project. Um, today we will discuss uh, digital gender-based violence. Uh, following the COVID-19 pandemic, this has led to a digital leap and daily life has turned, so to say, into the matrix. Um, all social interactions, entertainment, but also work takes place in this digital world. But for many women, this matrix turned out to be a misogynist nightmare. According to data from the United Nations, uh, women globally are 27 times more likely than men to be harassed online. And this is particularly the case for women in leadership positions, such as journalists and members uh, of parliament. Um, according to a survey from the International Center of Journalists and UNESCO conducted this month, 73% of female journalists experience online abuse, harassments, threats, and attacks. Uh, following the pandemic, this has even been much more worse than usual. Uh, social media has also been identified as the number one place where members of parliament suffer from psychological violence. Um, so today's question is, how can we make sure that women in leadership positions are not being silenced online? Um, Jen Paul's recent report that Scarlett already briefly mentioned, when technology meets misogyny, multi-level intersectional solutions to digital gender-based violence provides an overview of this phenomenon and also offers examples of good practices and solutions to address this issue. And that brings us to today's first speaker, uh, Kiara. I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on the various forms of digital, digital gender-based violence and how these forms impact women. And also if you could explain why it is particularly women in leadership positions that are targeted. Hello everyone, and uh, thank you Scarlett and thank you Laura for the introduction. Uh, as it was mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Jempo Gender and Policy Insights. Uh, I am one of the co-founders uh, and I am uh, the Brussels person, I would say. Um, so I'm very glad to be here and thankful to uh, BB Beyond. Um, and I will go in one second to reply to your uh, uh, questions, Laura. But before then, uh, I would like to say that uh, it's great to be here with you today and to talk about this because um, uh, obviously Jampo has been working on the topic of digital gender-based violence now for a, uh, quite a long time. And the report uh, was born uh, much earlier than the current pandemic. But um, the pandemic today made uh, this topic even more important. And uh, the issue is that uh, now we are all online and that we know we work online, we socialize online, as it was mentioned. Uh, our contribution to political and social and economic life is done online. The issue is that uh, misogyny and digital gender-based violence is used consistently to silence women uh, and uh, to discourage them, especially when they are part of vulnerable groups to engage from a political point of view, uh, from a social point of view. So this means that the opportunities uh, for all of us and for people who are even much more vulnerable than us today talking uh, not around, the, well, around this uh, uh, figurative table um, are shrinking if everyone, uh, women are exposed to this phenomenon. So uh, this is just to say that this is in extremely important. Uh, however, all the information I will now try and give you were true even before the pandemic started. And now, Laura, I will try to answer to your question. Um, 
so uh, Jumder, Jean Paul uh, published in 2019 uh, a report which is called uh, When Technology Meets Misogyny, uh, in which we refer to the concept of digital gender based violence. Uh, which is not often the definition uh, used uh, among stakeholders, is a bit specific, but uh, our idea there, and this is part of the entire work we have done researching and advocacy, doing advocacy on this, is that uh, digital gender-based violence conveys the idea that online violence against women is a gendered phenomenon and it is a form of ser serious abuse so it's important to make a distinction from the general idea of cyber virtual violence bullying trolling and all these there is an important gender uh, element there that we need to take into account and that's why and that the reason why is that online abuse against women is qualitatively and quantitatively different from everything else uh, laura gave some numbers i have some more um so for example women globally she already mentioned i think that women globally are 27 times more likely than self-identifying men to be harassed online um violence against women tends to be extreme sexualized and motivated by gender and this is something that uh, a european um, a, a report from age uh, clearly uh, detected in a uh, in a wide survey in 2017 one in five women under 30 have experienced online sexual harassment in europe and 64% of female correspondents, so journalists, have been harassed uh, uh, and uh, encountered abuse in the course of their work uh, reporting on political and social issues. Um, going to women in position of leaderships, there are uh, surveys by the IPU uh, that explain that female parliamentarians and staffers are, were found that 58% are more likely to experience threats of violence online. Um, so this is are some, some numbers, but uh, I think the concept is that we as women are disproportionately more exposed to a, a, a list that I can start and I could go on and on and on of instances of um, sexual violence. I will give you some sexual harassment, sexual violence threats, unsolicited pornography, technologies uh, facilitated trafficking, image-based abuse, and many, many others. Um, so, um, Another thing that we really need to take into account, and I think right now that's timely and that's important, and especially in Brussels, it's something um, that is still not taken in account enough. Uh, violence online, digital-based violence, which women are the subject on, always always intersects with racist abuse and other forms of online bigotry so um if we really are looking at changing things uh we need to to consider this and we need to understand that women uh who are especially vulnerable will be in the position where um they won't be allowed to speak up they won't be allowed to participate because they are constantly uh, exposed to threat digital gender based violence is um, a new arena uh, so there gender-based abuse and discrimination are reproduced but it's also all violence there are some very complex causes which i think here most people know about but 
in the wider public, there's still a lot of discussion on. And uh, this is understanding that there are centuries of patriarchal norms and structures. Digital gender based violence, in this sense, is an attempt to silence, to punish, and to ostracize women who seek space, who want to express themselves, they, who want to achieve a position in their professional life or contribute to social life in, uh, um, in their community. Uh, basically, it's a way to stop any challenge to the status quo. This mechanism couples in digital gender-based violence with some genuinely novel traits, and I think we'll hear more about that for example, from Michela, um, because it's coupled with anonymity, which is granted to perpetrators. Um, it also includes far reach. You can hit from anywhere, and it's extremely difficult for authorities then to identify where the threat was coming from. Uh, there is the difficulty of removing content and uh, there is a tendency to, um, uh, this phenomenon tends to present itself in a mob-like mob feature. So it's not one person going against women, it's a mob. Um, why this is important? The, the repercussions are enormous individually for women who are threatened and who are uh, victims of, of this abuse, and they are comparable to repercussions of physical and sexual abuse. Uh, women who are exposed to digital gender-based violence experience depressive symptoms, hate and anxiety, sleep disturbances, damage to uh, sexual and reproductive life, loss of self-esteem, confidence, and concentration of power. I don't need to tell you how this impacts uh, women's role, um, the women's role in, uh, in social life. So this is the individual cost. There is a social cost as well. It's economic and because obviously women are not participating as much as they could. And it is uh, political because that impacts our democratic process. And I'd be happy to uh, elaborate on that later on, uh, but that's, I think, uh, the core of my argument here. Thank you. Thank you, Kiara, for highlighting the gender elements of digital violence. You already briefly mentioned the novel treats of this type of violence. Um, and that's actually the nature of social media platforms themselves. So anonymity of the perpetrators, but also it's difficulty to remove content. There's the issue of, of mobbing. Um, there are also, of course, echo chambers and abusive materials can spread very rapidly. And that actually brings me to you, Michaela. Um, what internal protocols and policies Facebook uh, has developed to overcome these hurdles? And what do you think is the biggest challenge at the moment? Yes, um, thank you so much, Lara, and thank you so much for the organizers, to the organizer for having me today. Um, I think, I mean, both you, Laura and Chiara have painted a very clear and also a very worrying picture of the, um, of the, um, the of online harassment against women, but also digital gender-based violence, which is clearly a very, uh, a major problem and plays um, a role in, in, as you were saying, in silencing women, but also in driving women offline. This is obviously unacceptable. Um, the opportunities of being online and being connected are, um, are very broad. They go from connecting with friends and family to uh, finding a job, to launching and growing a business, but also to fighting for a cause that, to be honest, the idea that um, half of the world's population would be um, excluded from this opportunity, as I was saying, is, is absolutely unacceptable. Um, especially now that with the COVID-19 um, epidemic, we've seen that there is an even higher reliance on digital spaces. Um, we need to do everything that we can to keep women um, in all positions, from leadership to, uh, to normal women on, online, in order for them to take uh, advantage of these opportunities. 
And um, as Facebook, we are committed to providing a positive um, and meaningful experience to our users, to women in particular. And we are very aware of the fact that in order to provide this opportunity, in order to, um, for women to, to grasp this, we are responsible for um, to provide a safe space, a, a space that is safe from abuse, that is uh, that, that does not replicate the same barriers to community participation that we already see in the offline world. Um, this, as you can imagine, is is quite challenging. As Facebook is a is a really as a really large and diverse community, we have almost three billion users, and um, and our community is, um, has very different vari variety of beliefs and also different levels of tolerance to different kinds of content. But nevertheless, we are absolutely committed to um, to the fight, and we have. Um, we have developed a, a bit of a holistic approach to ensuring safety on the platform. It all starts from our policies, which is uh, it's a global set of uh, policies that we call community standards and that cover uh, over 22 different kinds of abuses. And some of them are also very clearly um, um, abuses that women are particularly affected, um, affected by. We, uh, um, an important thing about our policies that they're constantly evolving. Um, we try to stay on top of all the new, trend, new trends and new threats. And we have, um, we involve experts from academia, from safety organizations, but also linguists and anthropologists in our, from all around the world in our policy development process, because we understand that it's very important for us to be, um, to be aware of how abuse and harassment manifest itself online but also aware of the different cultural norms around things like sexuality, friendship, but also the different role that women play in different society. societies, which, are, which as you know, um, can be very dif uh, different in, in different countries. Um, this being said, our community standards try to encompass, as I said, they're global. So they try to encompass all those differences um, and, um, and they establish very clear rules on um, what is allowed and what is not allowed, but also on specific behaviors that affect women. Um, some of our um, some examples are for are for instance the the real name policy that we have on Facebook, which kind of responds to your point earlier being made about how dangerous anonymity online can be. So on Facebook, we actually expect and demand from our users that they um, that they register themselves and they express themselves. Uh, using their authentic um, name. Uh, but then also we have policies with regards to actual abusive behaviors like bullying and harassment, sharing of non-consensual intimate, um, non-consensual sharing of intimate imagery, uh, human trafficking and human smuggling that was mentioned before, and also hate speech, which is, um, which is one that is very, is very recurring and um, and, and with regards to hate speech, we, uh, I mean, obviously we have no tolerance for it. We think that it creates an environment of exclusion and in some cases it can uh, foster um, real world harm. Um, and hate speech is one example of policies that evolve constantly in, rea in response to different threats that we, that we see and that we're being told about. And a good example of, of an evo evolution in our policies is the fact that uh, we last year expanded our hate speech, uh, hate speech policy to include also female gender terms and curse words, which are now banned. We also look at ways to not only improve our policies, but also improve our action against violation of those. And uh, earlier this year in July, we announced that we were going to have stricter action against perpetra perpetrators of rape threats. So just to be clear, rape threats have been in our community standards for uh, since their inception, and we've always removed them every time we were made aware of them. But now the latest development is that we are now enforcing more strongly against the perpetrators, and we are disabling profiles and accounts that, um, that um, push and that make um, rape threats on, online. Um, obviously, in order for these policies to be uh, to be um, to be active, we enforce against them. And in order for them to be uh, to be active at our scale, um, we use um, we use technology for that. We rely on um, on artificial intelligence and machine learning classifiers in order to detect and take down specific kinds of content. 
but we are also aware of the limits of this technology. And uh, for this uh, reason, we are we are developing. We've developed it, we've developed a series of tools that we give to our users for them to be in control of the experience that they have online so that they can control what they share, who they share it with. And some examples of those, two, of those tools are, for example, the unfriend feature, the blocking feature, but also reporting. We have set up a reporting system so that all of our users and women can inform us when they are being, um, when they're being um, uh, mistreated or when they're being harassed. Um, a, an interesting example, I think, of, of a tool that was developed in reaction to, uh, to developing threats and, the, and as a result of conversations with, with, um, with experts and organizations is the, the um, development of the mute feature on Messenger, which was launched in 2017. And it was a result of conversations with um, NGOs active in domestic violence that basically explained to us that um, that in some cases, blocking your uh, abuser is just not an option for victim of domestic abuse for two reasons, mainly one, the fact that it exposes uh, victims to potential of retaliation from the abuser that becomes aware of being blocked. But also because sometimes women, when they gather the, the courage of, of, um, of um, uh, reaching out to law enforcement, um, they need evidence of the abuse and blocking um, the abuser means that they would not have access to this um, to this content. Um, I think there is there's a lot of other things that we that we have um, in order to support our victims. We have a, set, a series of resources that we've developed over the years and we've developed with, uh, with partners, um, um, starting from help centers, safety centers, different portals. Um, an example is, um, is um, um, a specific section in our COVID-19 info center that was developed very recently and that provides tips for people who are experiencing domestic abuse, but also their friends in order to help them. And also we've included a directory of national and international helplines um, that was developed together with UN Women and the US National Network to End Domestic uh, Violence. I think the underlying message here is that we rely heavily on partnerships in order to, um, in order to develop our policies, but in order to launch projects, to raise awareness. Um, I'm aware that I'm probably running out of time, so I'll, I'll, try, uh, I'll wrap up now, I'll stop now, but I'll be happy to give more details about everything that we do and, and also about our uh, openness to do more and to collaborate with other stakeholders in order to get on top of this terrible um, form of abuse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michaela, for highlighting um, the policies and features that Facebook offers to, count of, to counter this type of violence. Um, there are also, of course, measures and regulations on the governmental side, and that brings us to today's final speaker. But before I turn to Monica, I would like to remind everyone in the audience to please submit your questions through Slido. Um, Monica, uh, we've now heard what Facebook is doing in this field. How have policies in, the, in this domain evolved over the years? And how can we uh, reorientate existing EU tools, for instance, in the field of online privacy, to more closely address the problem of digital gender-based violence? And I was also wondering how recent initiatives, such as the European Democracy Action Plan, address digital gender-based violence against female journalists, but also other women in leadership positions. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, big thank you. And uh, thank you to, to Jen Paul. Thank you, Chiara, for the document, because We've been waiting for this kind of study for a long time. Second, thank you goes to the organizers of this event because I believe that this is an important initiative and uh, please just more of these. Uh, I can share with you my frustration today because this issue has been around for some time already and what I observe myself uh, in my role as an advisor to the vice president uh, on uh, values and transparency. Uh, there is an evolution, as you call it, in terms of the willingness to address this problem. Okay, fair enough, but it's not enough yet. 
uh, let's look into the history a little bit. It was only in 2013 when the first ever EU-wide survey on the gender-based violence was conducted. So it's only seven years when, since we have the European data available. Why? Why we couldn't have the data for 20 years or more? Because the violence against women is there forever. So we are speaking here about the European context and about the uh, community of values, which is also evolving because we know how the EU was funded and what it meant first, economy, etc. But now we all agree that this is about more. And uh, thanks God that the violence against women is now also on the agenda of the policymakers at the EU. Then when it comes to the online violence against women, there is this Istanbul Convention uh, instrument, which again, it's a young one. This convention, which I don't think I have to introduce to anybody because all the viewers are familiar with this. This is first ever complex and comprehensive instrument addressing the violence against women, and it has been adopted uh, by the Council of Europe only 10 years ago. So again, it's young, so it's, but it's the evolution. And we have to work with um, what we have available and think progressively and creatively how we can enforce what we have and maybe come up with something more also at the EU level. So this is to your first part of the question. Uh, what about the evolution? Uh, in 2016, um, there has been um, the document signed by the big tech industries. I think Michaela is uh, familiar with this called Code of Conduct on Hate Speech and Hate Crime. It has been a voluntary commitment of the tech industry initiated and facilitated by the European Commission where the tech industry agreed to uh, take down the uh, content noticed or uh, referred to, which would include the illegal hate speech or hate crime. The problem was then that um, the tech industry only agreed to take down the illegal content where the harmonization of the illegality exists at the European level. And this is not the case for the gender-based violence. So it didn't include the violence against women with hate speech or hate crime. And this I consider um, scandalous that it hasn't been considered at that time, that, that it has not been even voluntarily accepted by the tech industry to include it into the commitment. But I'm so glad to hear now that, for example, um, one of the social media um, represented here has already included into its internal policies um, this type of hate crime or, or hate speech. But we know that the voluntary commitment is not enough. Um, it didn't work so far. So you might be aware that um, in the coming weeks, the European Commission will be adopting a major um, legislation regulating uh, the digital sphere. This is called the Digital Service Act. It is long time awaited um, uh, legislation, which will bring in the responsibility and accountability of the digital services. And it will also include, uh, as far as I expect, um, the uh, notice and action procedure, which might include the illegal um, hate speech and hate crime. Uh, the other evolution we might expect in the coming year, and it uh, is related to the safety of the female journalists, which you asked about, Laura, is uh, the recommendation of, of the safety of journalists with the special focus on female journalist safety, because the numbers we've heard several times today, they're also just, you know, self-telling. Um, the recommendation means that it won't be necessarily legally binding from the European Commission towards the member states, but it is already a strong enough a soft law measure or provision, which I believe will be then considered at the 
level of member states to ensure that they are follow-up actions. This is just to initiate, to, to, to send a clear signal from the European Commission in the area where the competence of the European institutions might be questionable to proceed and, as I said, to, to point out what are the issues which might be addressed uh, where the legislation at the European level is not uh, possible at the moment. Uh, you might also notice the um, gender equality strategy adopted by the Commission of uh, President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, where the violence against women uh, has a big uh, part. And there, uh, the European Commission is committing to adopt a new harmonizing legislation on violence against women. It is uh, now scheduled for 2021, so it uh, should come next year. And I think it will be a big step forward. It is to, in a way, remedy the situation where the accession to the Istanbul Convention I've mentioned earlier has not yet been finalized. And we are seeing the uh, resilience in uh, some member states. Because let me uh, pause a little bit at this uh, instrument again. The Istanbul Convention, as such, has been already ratified by 21 member states of the European Union. What does it mean that interpreting the Istanbul Convention, it is clear that it also concerns the online violence, or you call, you call it uh, digital violence against women, but it is not enforced at the national level. So there is a big question how to ensure this enforcement. We might have a follow-up legislation which would strengthen the rule on uh, enforcing the, uh, the rules in the digital world. We might also consider the cooperation among several sectors, as uh, was also indicated in the recommendation um, in the GenPol document. There are some other steps which might be taken, but it definitely requires further action. It's just not, it won't happen per se that people will stop with the um, behavior online towards women. We just have to take the action. And that's my main message today, that the Commission is fully committed to do it. We are well aware about the problem. We are looking into the ways where we have a space as a European Commission to legislate, and where we don't have a space to legislate, to go further with the soft law measures to ensure that in at the member states level, and mostly at the, at the level of the victim or the survivor of such kind of violence, there is an action. So this would be for, for me for the beginning, and I'm looking forward for the questions. Thank you, Monica. You've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, we already have a few questions on Slido. Um, Catherine asks, can you expand a bit on the consequences a, pr a proven online abuser suffers? Account blocking or more? What stops them from creating a new account? Uh, Michaela, do you want to answer this question? Yes, I mean, obviously, that's uh, that's something very hard. The the um, the blocking of users from creating from creating new uh, new accounts. Nevertheless, we do have systems to do that, and we also have systems again to give the the user the the victim control over. The, um, the 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 situation and there is another feature that is called super block that allows users not only to block the the account of the abuser but it allows them to block in case that same um, account that would be recognized through the IP access and through other uh, signals um, that account would try to contact them again so that would not be possible with regards to the penalties of course we apply different uh, levels of penalties we do not disable all accounts that uh, find themselves in that, that that violate our policies because obviously we apply we apply different severity to different kinds of uh, to the severity of the different kinds of abuses obviously great thank you we also got a question from Carlotta. Uh, she asked, is there any data on the effect of digital-based violence on transgender women? And what can be done to make sure any initiative is as inclusive as possible? 
Um, Kiara, do you want to respond to this one? Yeah, well, um, there are obviously, um, there are data, people are collecting data, there's research ongoing. Uh, so, and I think the good news um, is that uh, the idea that intersectionality and so uh, the idea that we need to take into account the effect uh, on all different groups is becoming much more uh, uh, widely accepted even outside the academic world, which is where, in a, in a way, well, the activist world is the same. This being said, how do we uh, guarantee um, that uh, inclusion uh, is something which is part of the, uh, of the solution? Well, there's still a lot of work to do there because, um, uh, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, we are just starting with the idea that inclusiveness must be part of any policy, mainstreaming inclusivity. Um, and uh, right now, there's a lot of discussion on trans transgender rights, uh, but the issue is still very new. And I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's still a minority that do, of people who are discussing uh, the implications for uh, for specific groups uh, of vulnerable people. So I don't have an an answer. I just uh, can say that uh, we are aware, and more and more people are aware. And uh, I think some progress is being made, but there's still a very long way to go. Thank you, Kiara. Related to this, there are also some concerns from our watchers about um, Facebook's policy to have to use real names. Um, for instance, Reina says that this can be very harmful to transgender people. Um, there are also, for instance, Kiara also wonders how Facebook is able to ensure that people use their real names. Um, so Michaela, are you able to elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a bit of a catch twenty two, right? I mean, the the anonymity in some cases is is problematic for the safety of of users, but in other instances, like for example, the case of um, of transgender drag queens, I think there was a big case in the in the media um, a few years ago um, about that. Um, and in that case, obviously, the the possibility of using um, an alias um, could um, is is necessary um, and also is is representative of the true persona that that an individual represents or or feels represented by. I think our answer there is that we are um, we we remain committed to having uh, verifiable names um, linked to the accounts of our users, but we also understand and we're hearing the feedback of the community that it's important that the policy works for everyone, especially for the communities that are that are marginalized. And, um, and that's kind of one of the cases where, uh, that I was mentioning earlier, where we enter into conversations with experts to better understand um, this different, uh, this different um, uh, evolving uh, situations, and we try to find an answer together with the experts. Thank you. You mentioned the uh, collaboration between experts earlier. You also mentioned partnerships and cooperation between stakeholders. Um, that's also something that's highlighted in the report, the collaboration between the European Women's Lobby and Google as a best practice of cross-sectoral cooperation. And that is something I wanted to ask you, Monica, how the EU can stimulate such public-private, but also cooperation with civil society? Uh, and how can this be used to protect female leaders online? And uh, what are the current hurdles to kind of further support such collaboration? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Um, I've already mentioned the um, voluntary commitment which uh, the Commission initiated, um, and the commitment was on the side of the tech industry. So I would consider this already as a cooperation on collab or collaboration. Second, we can, of course, stimulate um, the, um, the, the policy 
kind of enforcement through funding. And um, hopefully there will be the future funding for projects uh, of civil society or um, and other actors also in the area of the violence against women. This has been on the menu uh, of projects for, uh, funded by the European Commission or the EU money for already quite time. Uh, previously, it was called the Daphne program. I'm sure that people are familiar with this. It has already, it's kind of, you know, it resonates. Uh, we don't call it Daphne program necessarily anymore, but there is a, that there are money for this cause, which are coming directly from the European Commission. But what is also important that there are money which the European Commission is providing directly to the member states, and member states should use this money not only for building infrastructure, the hardcore infrastructure, meaning the railroads, etc., but also the infrastructure, for example, to help victims of violence or uh, to, to build the intersectional approach uh, on, on its area. So uh, these would be the main two tools, I would say, um, where the stimulation would be, I think, the most efficient, the money, and then the soft pressure threatening with the hardcore legislation in the future in action taken. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Monica. Then we also got a question on Slido from Catherine. Uh, what are our reports out there that quantify the impact of online gender-based violence on mental health? Do you want to tackle that, Chiara? Well, um, how, how can we quantify that? Um, it's extremely difficult, but um, there's something I want to say um the 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 effects uh as i was mentioning before are uh completely comparable uh to physical violence uh or in person abuse i would say there's um there's a, a plus let me pass this uh we are talking here about a phenomenon where um survivors will live again and again and again the experience because the, the the object of the violation can be reproduced and disseminate online uh in a way which is not quantifiable um there is an impact on mental health i think um there is an economic uh, impact which comes from that and it's probably at some to some extent quantifiable because in the moment where women need to be online to work and to be part of the society mental health trickles down to impact our role uh, as uh, uh, social and economic actors i hope that answers the question to an extent Thank you, Chiara. Then we also got a question from Arpurva um, directly to Monica. Could you please shed some light on the outcomes of the hashtag digital respect for her campaign on digital gender based violence? Yes, this has been one of our attempts to uh, bring attention to this issue. It was last year. It was directly before the uh, elections into the European Parliament. The campaign has been uh, launched by then Commissioner for Justice Vera Jourova and then Commissioner for Digital uh, Madame Gabriel. So these two ladies, as you might know, uh, got their second mandate in the College of uh, Commissioners and they are both still committed to this cause and this is one thing which i think is important for the evolution we were talking and discussing at the beginning of our session today that today at the european level we have already committed leaders politicians not only female leaders but i would not hesitate to say that the majority of the college members, the commissioners, would stand behind this cause, who are willing to change things. It starts with the President von der Leyen, it goes through the Vice President Jourova, and it ends up with Madame uh, Commissioner Dali, who is the first ever commissioner 
for equality. And these three ladies, I think they have the power, they have the means, and they have the, the, the determination to change these things. So I truly believe that we have now, the time is running, you know, we have like four years now to make sure that we deliver when it comes to the European framework for the protection of and prevention of the gender-based violence, including online some meaningful framework which then would be enforced at the national level because whatever we create here at the european bubble it needs to go down and it needs to make a real impact on women one thing which uh, the um, campaign uh, digital respect uh, for her uh, was meant was to attract women in certain positions to share their testimonies on the violence online and it has been some kind of analogy to the Me Too, because speak, again, speaking about, about evolution, I think it's worth to mention here and to kind of acknowledge again and again the entire Me Too campaign, which has been, I think, the breakthrough in the overall society um, conception uh, and perception of the violence against women, including online. It had different uh, impact in different parts of the world, I would say. But overall, if I may simplify, I think that this has been the breakthrough. So the digital respect for her was purely focusing on uh, digital violence against women. Uh, it was running for, I think, four months. And as I've already mentioned, um, the, the, the leaders who were behind it meant it for bringing attention to the topic and then the follow-up steps were taken. We had a meeting with the uh, tech industries at that time. We were trying to encourage them to uh, follow up with their policies. I remember that uh, Facebook um, then uh, committed also to follow up and Google as well. So I think that there is already a determination as we've heard from the tech industry, but I think that we need to really do more on all sides. Thank you. You also mentioned already the involvement of the, the tech industry. Um, we got another question about that, um, about the support of the moderators. Um, Raina says uh, that she can imagine that it takes quite a high toll to have to watch this really um, abusive content. Uh, Michele, you also already mentioned that you're also using artificial intelligence um, to take down content. Could you maybe explain a bit more when uh, human moderators are used and when these new uh, types of moderation techniques um, of artificial intelligence are used? Yes, um, I mean, we, we've heard very loud the, the, the issue around the, the human reviewers and the protection of their mental health being exposed to a certain kind of terrible um, um, con pieces of content on, online. We have been working uh, and investing quite consistently over the last few years in the development and the perfectioning of our uh, of our technology. We use, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, artificial intelligence, we use machine learning, classifiers. Um, we, we have uh, seen uh, a lot of progress in the accuracy of, um, of our technology and their ability to correctly detect, detect specific kind of content. Um, the, um, there still exists limitations with, uh, with uh, that, that accuracy. And that's where um, that applies to specific kinds of content, which are a little bit more um, uh, gray zones or very contextual, require a little bit more of um, more context and, and a better understanding, or require an interpretation of the intention. Um, for behind specific statements. And that's where I think the value of human re reviewers is, um, is very high uh, because the certain things that machines as smart as they can be, they just cannot, um, they just cannot understand even if, um, even in, in, an, in a piece of, in a specific kind of content, which is hate speech content, which is highly contextual, um, we have been able to make, uh, to make progress um, on, on our use of artificial intelligence. And we have now very high levels of content that is um, that is reported to us well that is 
detected uh, through um, artificial intelligence of hate speech content that is detected through artificial intelligence, um, which is um, uh, actioned even before anyone reports it and even before anyone sees it. Um, and um, and that's actually an interesting element is that we've introduced recently in our transparency reports the uh, metrics of prevalence, which is um, a metric that indicates how many times a bad content is seen. And uh, specifically, we've uh, we've published uh, data about the prevalence of hate speech on the platform, um, and um, and I think the metric is 0 0.01, which means that one every 10,000 pieces of content, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not, it's, it's not my forte, uh, but it means that um, that only one every 10,000 pieces of content is actually seen. Um, which, which basically translates into um, a very efficient um, removal of, of bad content from our end. Thank you. So you highlighted how emerging technologies can be used to take down abusive content. Um, but of course, emerging technologies can also create new threats for women. For instance, AI generated deep fakes, can also affect uh, digital gender-based violence against women in leadership. Um, so how can platforms, government, and civil society mitigate these negative consequences of such developments? And does this need new reporting and moderating mechanisms? Um, Chiara, maybe you want to tackle this one? Yeah, gladly. Um, uh, well, yes, reporting mechanism, um, for sure, uh, we need to, to develop reporting mechanism. We need, um, uh, we need obviously, uh, and again, I'm not, I mean, on the technological side, I, I, I don't have a specific uh, expertise, but um, we need to develop instruments in terms of artificial intelligence with the specific um, target, including uh, concerns related to gender. Uh, these are technological solutions which um, most uh, companies are already working on. Um, I, I think we need to be, um, we need to be clear this is a problem what which we tackle um, at a much broader level we are talking about a problem which is a uh, an uh, an expression of a much broader shift we are all living uh towards a digital economy a digital world and these are threats um which impact women but impact society as a whole so uh, we need to think about solutions which are multi-stakeholders and um, and we need uh, to, um, to research this in depth. We need to conceptualize this in the best possible way, understanding what are the roots of this kind of phenomenon in terms of patriarchy and desire to silence vulnerable uh, groups. And uh, we need to uh, invest in education and we need to uh, invest in uh, uh, trainings inside companies, inside workplace, at adult level as well. Thank you, Chiara. You clearly highlighted the need for research and conceptualizing these new threats. I wanted to turn to you, Michaela, if you could say a few words on whether these reporting and moderating mechanism would need to be adjusted to these new uh, emerging technology threats. Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, it, it already happens. Um, reporting and technology is constantly updated as a, as a result of the feedback that we receive um, and the research that we we found or that we see um, um, with regards to the specific kind of threats. Um, I think an interesting element that you raised, Laura, is also the element of collaboration amongst different parts, uh, but also the role of the victim. Um, a, a very good example, I think, of how partnerships amongst tech company um, organize, um, safety organizations and, and users is, um, is a pilot that we launched in 2017 on um, against to fight against the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. 
it was developed together with um, with a bunch of international organizations, including um, US and Canada, uh, Thailand um, organizations, but also European ones. We have partnership with the UK Revenge Porn Helpline and with Permesso Negato, which is an Italian organization. And um, this project has basically been designed to help victims or potential victims of non-consensual sharing of intimate images to flag pieces of um, image, photos, or videos that they fear could potentially be published by their partners um, or exes um, um, on, online. And the way that it works is basically that we have created a system by which the users, the victim, is, um, is able to share this image in a safe and secure manner with the NGOs. And then these images are transformed into digital fingerprints or hashes like they're talk, they're, 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 they're um, uh, hashes. Um, and, um, and then those hashes are being added to a database that we and our technology can uh, detect and can map in order to prevent the uh, the publication of those nude and and um, or compromising um, images or video, and we are seeing a lot of um, a lot of progress in this space, and and we are seeing a lot more interest. But then I thought it was just an interesting way of showing how you know the collaboration is so important, and um, there's so many different um, roles, and um, and as platforms, we're very aware of the limits of our uh, of our knowledge, and we need. We need the users to report. We need the user to tell us what's happening to them, and we need organizations to uh, to to do the same. And of course, then there is a whole different discussion around the role and the and the relationship with the policymakers and with the law. So, but I thought it would be interesting to to share this bit. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I believe Scarlett, you had a question as well. Do you want to jump in? Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's really a fascinating discussion. Um, I just had one question, um, more a call for brainstorming, if I if I can call it like this. I wanted to turn more towards the leadership uh, discussion because that's a big part of our event today. Uh, it's in our title. And um, specifically, maybe on the role of algorithms, you have touched upon the role of AI, uh, but we at Bruegel discuss a lot the role of data, the role of algorithms, and uh, personally, I'm really, you know, um, fascinated by this topic of transparency paradox. And this has been actually mentioned by Facebook's uh, Nick Clegg in a, one of our events um, uh, this week. Because what we want to achieve actually is, um, you know, this is a double-edged sword. We want to give more visibility to women. That's what we are doing in the binder, for example. And there are so many initiatives out there. Uh, but in the same time, we want to do that through granting uh, privacy through ensuring privacy and protection. And this is another very important topic of today when it comes to the discussion of violence. Um, I read um, a, a study not so long ago, it was published uh, by the Leibniz Institute for Social Sciences um, that kind of found that algorithms do not uh, see the world in a mathematical way as we would like them to, but uh, they tend to replicate the biases that exist in society and just make them more uh, present. So they gave examples and they clearly uh, showed that, you know, pictures that you find or representatives that you find online, if they are white, ma white male, they are right away tagged as, you know, business people or um, white color workers and so on. While women often are tagged with, you know, nice smile, pretty face and these kind of um, tags, which you know, directly leads into, you know, if, if those tags can be targeted, um, then, you know, violence is much more easy to, to be stowed upon these people. So I just wanted, I was just really wondering how, you know, maybe this is a question more for Michaela, but I would not restrain that. I think it's, it's, it's a policy aspect as well, or what, how do we help this through policy? On, on striking the balance between, you know, giving the platform to women to be more, be more visible, step up their game, go out there, but in the same time, protecting them um, from these, these attacks. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can come in, I can offer a few thoughts. And then, as you said, Scarlett, maybe there's, there's other elements that might be 
uh, raised by others. I think, I mean, what you said is very true. I think it's been proven that there's been uh, bias being registered in, in, in the algorithms. And I think that one of the reasons is also the fact that actually um, a lot behind the, uh, the, the machines is, is, it is white male dominated. We were actually talking about that before we actually started the discussion um, in, the, in the backstage. And um, I think that, so one element there is obviously um, guaranteeing um, um, a bigger presence of women uh, in engineering and technology in the development of algorithm or not only women, but a very, a, a much diverse um, um, community of, of, um, of engineers and, and technical people uh, developing this technology is, is absolutely important. But also the awareness of the existence of the bias has also been uh, very critical. We started noticing, as you were mentioning, Scarlett, that there were patterns that were being replicated in the algorithms, not only against gender, but also against race. We were seeing an example of um, how in our um, in our artificial uh, sorry uh, augmented reality, uh, for example, uh, black faces were not recognized in some in some cases. So that was really worrying for us, and it was kind of like um, a, um, a bell, an alarm bell that made us realize that we needed to pay a lot more attention about uh, the development of this algorithm and also the in the um, injection of more fairness in the process. And we have been in the past few years working with researchers in the uh, in the space of algorithm algorithmic fairness um, to develop a new um, internal tool that is called um, fairness flow, and that it measures the algorithm fairness across a, a series of parameters that are growing and that you know that that are growing also as a result of these conversations that we're having and that include much more diverse training data for the algorithms and also a, a more robust um, model performance that uh, that allows you know more metrics to be taken to be taken into account this work is is only possible once again i want to reiterate this thanks to the collaboration and the partnerships that we have with experts in the field that not only allow us to surface, to surface specific issues, but also to, to uh, brain, brainstorm uh, potential solutions and, um, and, um, and figure out ways of, of going around the problem um, or actually not going around, but just put it past us because, uh, because we've solved it. Obviously it's an ongoing discussion. And then just to mention on the element of transparency, um, I think as, as Facebook, we've been quite open lately about our support for, um, for more transparency about our systems. We've been also, um, be, we've, we've opened up a lot about how our algorithmic uh, recommender systems works, for example. We've published last year, we've, we've developed this tool that is called Why Am I Seeing These? that allows all users to, uh, to uh, click by clicking through posts on their newsfeed to realize why they're being suggested specific content versus other. Um, and, um, and we've also made this point very clearly um, in, in um, with regards to the need for uh, or, or our, our expectation of, of uh, EU regulation as well to, uh, to, um, to focus a lot on, on transparency, which we're seeing already. Um, and then finally, I think that you mentioned as well, this, this paradox, there is, there's always a fine line between being transparent and being too transparent. Um, in, and, and, and there is something, uh, there, there are some levels of, um, of transparency, some, some levels that maybe should not be shared in order not to give an edge and an advantage to the abusers. So, and those that are trying to gain the system. So um, it's, it's a fine balance, but I think again, that through collaboration and through discussion, it's, it's, it's achievable and we're working towards that. Thank you so much. Scarlett already brought the discussion a little bit more back to um, women in leadership in particular. We also got another question about Monica, that slider. I think, I think Monica wanted to follow up. Ah, really? just, sorry, I just saw the message. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, Laura, if I uh, interrupted your next question, but I'm sure that we have enough time to get to it. I just wanted to follow up to uh, the question of Scarlett about algorithms and transparency, because I personally see this very problematic because the algorithms um, are used for micro-targeting and this is used for monetization. So that's all. And I think that as far as the tech industry is going after this purpose, it's really problematic. 
Uh, it's not my personal view, uh, but um, I truly believe that this commitment we've heard about today already um, to also serve to the society good and wealth uh, will, and to also engage in more discussion and collaboration uh, will uh, bring um, the discussion and the progress a little bit further because I don't want to bring back the bad memories, but we all know what happened with Cambridge Analytica and we all know what could be the impact of using algorithms. And I think that this is really dangerous. It can just change the, the world order in a way. So uh, we might discuss now the, the issue related to the uh, women visibility, but I think that unless we recognize how dangerous it is, and unless there are clear, clear rules for this, we won't move forward. The digital revolution, the digital age we are living in, it's the biggest change our society is experiencing from the Neolithic times. Let's face it, it's, it's not comparable to anything that happened 100 years or 200 years ago. Within the last 40 years, we experienced such a change in our behavior, in the way how we are doing our business, how we are doing politics, how we are making friends, how we are uh, socializing ourselves, that it is a clear change, which I call biggest since, um, since centuries. And I think that it really deserves a thorough, not only discussion, but also balancing and as I call it regulation, I'm not a big fan of regulating everything, don't get me wrong. But in this case, I think that we've seen enough, we've seen the danger, and we have to be honest to ourselves on what we want to achieve. So hence, I think that to allow researchers also to uh, and the civil society or some kind of oversight on what algorithms are used when it comes to the, uh, the company and the digital platforms, I think this is the first step and we are not there yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. That is also something that, that was in the forefront of your report, Chiara, kind of this transparency and accountability aspect, but also uh, data for researchers to actually highlight these problems. Um, do you want to elaborate on it as well, kind of from a civil society perspective? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Monica. I, I think there's a revolution going on and we will need to regulate because uh and we will need to do it after while actually while uh we understand how all this impacts our society uh we are collecting data and we are doing that every day and we are trying to understand more to understand the impact of, of living in such a digital world and Let's face it, this pandemic has accelerated a lot of processes. Um, so maybe we were not ready. Um, but uh, it, it won't self-regulate. Uh, we need to understand uh, what are the dynamics, the deep social dynamics behind, uh, uh, behind this, uh, this phenomenon and then we need to regulate to mitigate the effects on those people who are most affected. And as I mentioned before, uh, there's an argument here uh, which needs to be, uh, which needs to brought forward, which is we need to protect our democracy and participation right now pass through uh, our online lives and uh, there's a backlash there is a backlash it, that's I think it's undeniable uh, which uh, is uh, political and is a response to the advancement of equality which we have seen in the last uh, probably in the last decade concerning women concerning um, racially different uh, group uh, and uh, transgender people uh, and uh, we know about that the, but there is a backlash going on and um, uh, there are some digital means which are used uh, by uh, groups which don't which are not fun who are not fond of this advancement inequality 
uh, which are used to attempt and stop progress in this sense. And digital online violence, it's exactly this in many, many instances. And since we are talking about women in leadership, uh, you know, uh, threatening people uh, and women who are trying to be part of the public discourse, it's exactly this, I think. Yeah, thank you for highlighting also the kind of political aspects. Um, and that is also something we saw in the comments on Slido. Uh, Raina said, so going back to the original questions, how do we ensure women in uh, leadership positions are not silenced? Violence takes many forms, including career development obstacles. Um, I think this also really ties in with the element uh, on training and education. So how can we prepare female leaders for this? How can we train them to be resilient and know how to deal with the consequences? Um, I was wondering if any of you can, any, can share any best practices about such training programs. Um, I, I can go first. I think first I wanted to add an element which is um, which is often uh, overlooked with regards to the education. There is a lot of education obviously that needs to be done for, for women to, as you were saying, to be more resilient and whatever. But I think that even more key is education of men and boys and in order to really eradicate specific views on, on women and specific behaviors and approaches to women which is really the root problem here, because I mean, it, it may sound like very convenient coming from me to say that, uh, that online harassment and online hate speech is just a reflection and a mirror of what happens offline. But I think that it's been said also very consistent, consistent, consistently by researchers in the space. So it's, it's, it's an issue, it's an absolute issue in the digital world but it's an issue that stems and has very deep roots into the, the patriarchal society that, that we see and the partners in the sense. So, um, so um, I think um, th this is very important to, to be highlighted. In terms of some of the initiatives that Facebook does to, uh, to empower women in, in leadership, we have several. We have an initiative that is called She Leads, which is specifically aimed at training um, women politicians um, about um, how to stay safe online, to empower them, to use our tools to moderate their pages. Because uh, as I was saying at the beginning, it's just unacceptable that women might be driven offline because of the harassment that they experience online. Um, and then um, another element which I think is, is relevant is the importance of counter speech. So um, not, only, um, not only educating, not only strengthening women's resilience and, and answers to, and, and, and their own, to, to strengthen their own uh, systems to deal with these things, but also counter the negative narratives online. And there, I think, I mean, Monica was mentioning the, uh, the code of conduct, the code of conduct um, against illegal hate speech online. There, obviously, we've developed some, um, some uh, strong relationships with NGOs. And one of the elements um, of the code is also the support of counter speech campaigns. Um, and we did that, we did so during and before the European elections uh, last year. We supported a broad pan European campaign from the NGOs of the code of conduct. Um, and then just a bit of a spoiler alert of something that is coming. We're working now partnering with an organization called I Am Here International. And we're gonna soon launch um, um, a project that is called Courage Against Hate. And it's, main to, and it's, it's meant really to empower um, um, users to, to promote positive narratives online and at the same time train uh, people to to um, to um, that are in positions of for, of specific of, of more visibility to be drivers of these positive um, narratives and and we started actually with the first counter speech uh, training with I am here international last week um, and we organized one with members of the European Parliament 
um, where we both um, did a little bit of the she leads training, uh, giving uh, giving um, a training on how to stay safe on Facebook and Instagram, but also added this element of counter speech. So to empower members of the parliament to defend themselves, but also to counter the negativity that they receive with positive um, messages. Thank you. You also mentioned briefly the, um, the need for research. Chiara, do you also want to respond to this? What kind of best practices have been identified in your report? Yeah, so um, the report actually is exactly looking at best practices because the idea there is that we need action at different levels. Now, I, I can't really go into uh, all uh, case studies now, but I think uh, there is a very powerful example in uh, in our report, which is the personal story of one of our researcher in Romania. She is a she's a journalist and an academic researcher, and she was a she is a survivor herself of um, revenge porn. Um, uh, sh her name is Venera Dimolesco, and um, she was able to. Uh, put together a survivor-led research project. Uh, and uh, they were able, uh, through these and through the involvement of a number of grassroots organizations to spark a national conversation, uh, which uh, finally led to a new anti-revenge porn law in Romania. So uh, really, they were able to bring this to a regulation point. And I think there, the idea that the research was really, uh, we can say, stick to the facts. So uh, explaining things how they were for people who were the object of these uh, violence instances uh, was able to really spark an interest. Um, another uh, case study, which I think might give some uh, interesting insight is the one of the organization ChildNet. Um, they are a British organization. And they work with uh, young people mainly. Uh, so the focus was on young children. But I think it's interesting because they tackled their uh, ad an, an advocacy strategy at a, a different level. Obviously, before then, there was a huge research effort which brought to the production of some uh, toolkit and practical resources, but then they targeted not only uh, company boards, but also police, which I think is very interesting because not always uh, police forces are well trained to address this kind of situation, social workers and teachers. And there we get to the point where, obviously, uh, as I said, I'm convinced we need action right now and we need regulation and we need to uh, spread research. But we know also really need to invest in the future and so act uh, by um, involving uh, those workers with ha which have a strong contact with younger people uh, because they can um they can have a, a, an impact in the long run uh on the on the teaching curricula for example which is a, an extremely uh important element which we and we don't have a, a an harmonization at the european level uh but uh that could really be a turning point in the long run if we could address some of those cultural problems at the back of all those phenomena we have been discussing uh, until now. Thank you, Chiara. I wanted to come back to one point you mentioned, and that is regulation. So as a last question, I wanted to ask you, Monica, about regulation. We already discussed content moderation extensively, but what can the EU do to make content moderation frameworks clearer for platforms of the issue of digital gender-based violence? And how can we protect women in leadership in such a way? Thank you, Laura. Um, when it comes to women in leadership, I admit that I'm a big fan and believer into the targets and quotas. 
because I believe that to overcome the existing biases and structural uh, uh, boundaries, we have to combine all possible approaches. And one of them is also to set a clear targets. Now I'm not defining if it needs to be at the level of uh, uh, the regulation, the European one or national, it can be internal target. It can be for ourselves that I will say myself that I will have three, four, young ladies as a mentees and I will help them to grow in the career. It's just about an additional effort, which we all make as a person, persons, individuals, but also as uh, people in our different roles. And if I'm in the policy making and if I would be the politician to also um, introduce some kind of framework in this sense, it can be done in the business, etc. Uh, we have uh, in the European Commission, just uh, to, to give an example, set in 2014 a clear target of 40% uh, of women in the management positions in the institution. And we were coming from 25% and by 2019 we were there. So again, it just wouldn't happen per se spontaneously. It required additional effort. There has been a clear uh, action plan behind it, including the um, talent uh, management program for uh, female uh, candidates, etc. So, just to speak to talk about the women in leadership, I think that nobody yet mentioned this important approach, which uh, can be combined also with uh, the mainstreaming, um, etc. When it comes to the regulation uh, on the content, I think that this is important to highlight again that every single regulation which uh, uh, is to be or should be adopted at whatever level within the EU and also beyond needs to reflect and respect the fundamental rights, which includes the freedom of expression and freedom of speech. And this is always very thin line between regulating, um, on, uh, in, especially in the digital uh, sphere and between keeping this balance. You are aware of um, the general data protection rules, the so-called GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, which is already addressing this issue. It has been adopted a few years ago. It is directly uh, applied because it's the regulation. So every member state has to follow these basic rules, which are trying to strike this balance between the, um, the privacy and the, the fundamental rights, and also not to hinder the evolution and the digital innovation. And this is something what needs to be safeguarded also when we talk about the regulation for the future um, in the digital sphere regarding the content. That would be my answer. Thank you so much. Um, and with this, I would like to conclude the event. We have discussed many different aspects of digital gender-based violence against women in leadership. Um, we highlighted the urgency of the issue, especially now uh, among the COVID-19 pandemic, and that women are even more dependent on these social platforms for their careers. Um, we discussed the uh, respective roles of civil society, um, including the need for more research, but also the role of the private sector, uh, voluntary codes and moderating roles. Um, and also what, what on the government side can be done. Um, best practices, international frameworks, such as the, in, uh, the Convention of Istanbul. Um, but I think what has been most highlighted here is the need for collaboration between the different sectors. Um, a good example of this was the voluntary code of conduct. Um, but also, we need to do more, especially in terms of transparency uh, related to algorithms, accountability of platforms, uh, education and training of women, uh, but also regulation, as you just mentioned, Monica, targets um, and international frameworks to protect the fundamental rights of, um, of, of women. Um, and with this, I want to uh, thank the speakers, um, organizers, and all the participants, of course. But before we conclude this event, I want to give the floor to, uh, to Scarlett to say a little bit about the next steps of the project. Thank you, Laura. Um, <clears throat> and let me just say thank you again to the speakers. Um, Michela, Monica, Chiara, it's been amazing to, to, to have you on uh, today. 
and the work does not stop here, fortunately or unfortunately, it cannot stop here. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity also to, to let you know that we have some uh, big milestones still coming under the project, um, namely mid-January. So we will start uh, next year with uh, hopefully with um, a big boom. Um, we have a, a round of toolkits coming out of the Brussels Binder Beyond project. And they are uh, they have been put together with our network, which is which is a great achievement, I think, on our side. We um, we have around five or six toolkits coming out, and they they have all been put together with specific experts from different member states um, that we work with in the network. We will, uh, as I mentioned, publish them mid January, and they really deal with a variety of topics, uh, starting with you know male male allies that was raised today in our discussion how to improve gender balance in conferences, uh, how can the media be more inclusive, how can we help women be more uh, visible in citations and in research in general. So there are a lot of good information in there and, and we hope that it can support the work of all of you and, and um, I invite you to pick it up in January and, and work with us to, to, to make it known. And with that, uh, I think, a uh, final thank you remains on my side. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, and let's continue the discussion. Let's not stop it here. <laughs>